Hello, my friends, and welcome back to the Brightworks and a matchup beyond all reason that I am just thrilled to bring you. Today's match is played on a brand new map. It was also played while live on stream. We do these live streams Tuesdays and Saturdays from 12 to 4 PDT. It's not a tremendously long time slot, so you got to be on top of it if you want to participate. And I definitely encourage you to because it is some of the best fun that can be had out in the beyond all reason subspaces. Today, spawning on Europe in Europe, somewhere in Europe. I guess this is sort of more towards like, uh, oh, I, I, I don't want to say exactly. My, my world geography is quite bad, but you might have noticed this map is called World on Fire. It is a exact replica of our world, or well, you know, more or less a, a world map that it, we're going to be playing on today. It's a pretty interesting one, but spawning over here on the front lines of the blue team at the very least. And uh, I'm sure I'll be flamed in the comment section for not knowing exactly which parts of the world this will be. I know this is somewhere in like the Middle East area, sort of uh, north of Africa here. But anyways, representing the blue team is an Armada commander goes by the name of Planyan. Now yours truly will be playing as the red team leader spawning in the back line here and going into not Cortex. Easy to think it's Cortex, but actually Legion Air. Yeah, quite a weird thing. You're probably thinking, Mr. Brightworks. Legion T1 Air is absolute garbage. Why are you playing Legion T1 Air? Well, I'll show you in just a little bit what the plan was. Uh, the plan changed a little bit during this match. I still remember it quite vividly, but uh, yeah, plans plans change. But a lot of the gameplay revolves around this little bad boy right here, the Martyr, the uh, self-destructing Kamikaze drone. It's uh, nice that I got a new name, the Martyr, rather than just the Kamikaze drone. Feels a little bit uh, nicer, I suppose. Anywho. I'm going to be playing as the red team leader here, 33 true skill. This was actually one of those smaller matches we played on this live stream. We uh, slowly but steadily increase the player limit. Usually as the live streams go on, we tend to start around 8 versus 8, and then it only goes up from there. But oftentimes, they do start out chill. So if you're looking for maybe a more chill game of Beyond Our Reason, maybe that's a uh, time frame for you to get in on the action. Otherwise, be prepared for some absolutely action-packed games of Beyond Our Reason. Spawning, uh, I guess, up here, sort of uh, Greenland, Iceland area. We have Mad Canuck going to be playing a little bit of Navy up here. We also have someone spawning out here in the ocean playing by the name of Jakey777. I love this map because I love that you can give geo geopositional callouts, right? You could say, uh, hey, somebody's pushing down in Antarctica, right? Or South America has been secured. You know, a Africa has been well exploited for its natural resources. <laughs> uh, you can just, you can really uh, put yourself all around the map and, and really get into a feeling like you're playing something like that. Also that and the fact that I really enjoyed playing Risk as a kid. I mean, I still enjoy playing Risk. It's hard to find people that are willing to play a game of Risk against me, but uh, oftentimes, it was really fun to play a game of Risk, even though they would, most of the time, take about six hours to complete a single game. OP Man, our uh, resident moderator for the day, you might notice, tuning in from beyond all reason. Yeah, gonna be showing us what he's got right here. The Green Commander, Barnek Barzi, realizing, hey, there's actually a contestant down here, holding the line right now on the southern side, or on the, uh, or I should say, on the western side of Antarctica, gonna be vying for control over those those uh, polar polar tundras, I guess you could call it on the southern side down here. I'm still a little bit in shock. I won't lie, I'm still a little bit in shock. This map uh, was discovered live on stream. I did not realize that this map was already up and out, so uh, as soon as I saw what this map was and saw that it was viable to play it in an 8v8 format, I was super stoked about it. Let's see, I sent a couple of fighters down here to try and catch some of the uh, constructors. And there we go, catching a couple of those constructors right here to try and shut down the expansion from Barnek Barzi. I felt pretty great about that. Did manage to catch the commander, though, while in his transport, but that's okay. Kadia Stan's going to be going for the back line over here. There's a geothermal over there, which is also quite important. But you can see the blue forces have pushed forward, containing all of Europe, Asia, and Africa. We also have Australia falling under their control here, and we find ourselves in a bit of an interesting position. Typically, uh, and I say typically, having just a couple of games of experience on this map, but so far what I've seen... Uh, it appears that mostly the left-hand side of the map, the, the western hemisphere, or the western side of the, the world here, focuses a lot more on naval production, right? So you have this big open navy area, tidal speed not fabulous, but because you have so much space, you can still go for those tidal generators and it can be fairly efficient. Whereas on the right-hand side, it's mostly geothermal in the early game. You can see those geothermals coming up right here, right here. There's a whole bunch of geothermals all over the place. There's also tons and tons of metal extractors. So the European spawns over here, I guess it's mostly the Asian spawn here, sort of the Asian-Russian spawn 
uh, over on the right hand side. They have a lot of advantages in the fact that they can walk right into Europe and Africa and capture all this, whereas the North American, South American areas, the Canadian Amer uh, Americas, all of these spots essentially have to deal with the metal that they've been given here. Aggression already on the high seas, and you can see, indeed, this is that naval advantage I was just talking about. We already have tons and tons of dolphins out and available for the red and orange commanders who are going to be controlling the southern sea here, and I would love to see them pushing forward. Obviously, this aggression can be, uh, can, well, can shut down the enemy snowball, right? You don't want to allow your enemy to get the chance to get those naval units up and running right here. Oslex is out in the water and going to start producing some of those boats, but right now we could absolutely crush the forces of the green player Sib with the uh, relatively high number of ships here for... The red team. Yeah, beautiful. I almost want to say my team. <laughs> Typically in these casts, I try and refer to them by red and blue team, but uh, whenever I'm whenever I'm playing on one of them and I happen to be the team leader, I can't help but associate them as my team, leading them to victory. Dolphins moving forward right here. Trying to catch some of these frigates. Doing a decent job at it. Dolphins not as overpowered as they once were. They used to dominate the high seas. Nowadays... They're uh, much more of a, a support sort of a vessel. They're, they're much more limited in their scope. Still quite powerful, but much more limited. You can see now the order of operations here, trying to get some of these Cortex, uh, sorry, some of these Legion facilities up and running, get some build power going. Grabbing this geothermal down, down on the uh, southern, southern tip of the Gulf of Mexico, trying to uh, put that geothermal to good work. Somebody pointed out that Yellowstone should have a, uh, should have a geothermal spot somewhere over here. I thought that was a pretty good idea. Personally, and we actually got a chance, by the way, to talk with the actual map creator. So in case you're interested in uh, looking through that, you can always go look through the replays, which are uploaded automatically. The whole, the whole live stream is always uploaded automatically. You just have to search by lives. Uh, and then you can you can go look through all that and you can see what the uh, actual map, the actual map creator had to say about this map and what he thinks about changing it. Uh, Soap tastes good, I think was his name. Confirm that down here. World in flames. Soap tastes okay. There it is. I think this map has a lot of potential. One of the interesting things about it is, of course, the fact that it has a free-for-all sort of asymmetric design, right? We have we have different areas that have different strengths, and and obviously the geothermal versus the navy versus you know the the kind of the the, the different ways that these patterns align with each other is pretty interesting. And then the fact that it can be played as a 8v8 versus a free-for-all is really unique. That's one thing that a lot of maps just can't really afford to do. Ancient Vault is a good example of one that manages to do that all right, but obviously that relies on it being uh, it, it, that relies on it being mirrored in multiple directions, so, or mirrored mirrored hor horizontally, yeah, mirrored across the plane here. Speaking of planes here, there go some of those kamikaze drones, the Martyrs, heading across the map to take down some of the anti-air defenses. As you can see, I was sending them out in little batches here to try and uh, yeah shut down some of these coastal defense lines and this is exactly what I think these planes are really good for using them to knock out little key infrastructure points like for instance metal extractors or constructors or anything like that you can see me microing them around and this was exactly what I wanted to do with the T1 air so T1 fighters are pretty abysmal so you can't really use those as any means of actually combating any air units but what you do have are these extremely cheap Bomber units, I guess, is what I would call them. I, I'm hesitant to call them bombers because they function so differently. But you can see effectively having the same, uh, the same effect, but to a uh, obviously self-detrimental degree. But this is exactly what I was hoping for. So you can see now I've taken out all the coastal defenses right here for the blue commander. And uh, what I should be doing right now is sending a bunch of these scout points forward to check out where the metal extractors are and trying desperately to blow those up as well. T2 Lab is already up and running for the Blue Commander, who's expanded quite rapidly here onto the African region and is using all that juicy, juicy metal to pump out some of those platypus. Very nicely done. You can see that Blue Navy is starting to grow in size. We do have some red subs eating up all this uh, metal that was laying at the bottom of the sea here from that very early engagement, so that's always good to see. But we're going to need way more res subs if we want to actually keep a Navy well repaired up on the front line. It's one of the most important parts of the Navy warfare as I've experienced, and especially after studying Venaja in some detail and realizing exactly how important it is, those res subs are exactly what keeps your Navy up and afloat here. You can see these destroyers are very heavily injured right here, and if you had four or five res subs, you could patch those back up and get them into the fight with no issue. 
Now we're on a bit of a timer here because obviously the blue team, the more units they put out in the water right now, the harder and harder it's going to be for our naval units to engage right now. So you can see we're building up more and more forces, but without any repairs on these. Oh yeah, res subs sleeping on the job right here. Absolutely should be repairing when and whenever possible. There's a submarine over here harassing some frigates. That's good. Always good to take that free damage. Here's the uh, martyrs coming in, trying to anyway. Yeah, sometimes they miss. <laughs> Not all reliable. Sometimes they uh, yeah end up a little bit, a little bit uh, uh, more. They leave more to be wanted, more to be desired. But you can see exactly what I'm targeting here. This is the this is the thing that I think they're really specifically good for is targeting key infrastructure points. So I've talked about this already, but the fact that you can, for instance, take down an entire lab like that extremely quickly, you can see Plunian accidentally eating up half of his own lab. Always really tricky when that happens. Forced to pull the resbots back and start using those to upgrade all of this. But that's exactly what these drones are so good for, is sniping key infrastructure points if you can manage to get them into the back line. They've been fixed since uh, a little while ago. They, what, what used to happen is when you would shoot them, they would fall out of the sky and still do damage. And what that meant is that there was effectively impossible to not get tremendous value out from them. That has since been changed, and now the way they work is if you shoot them down before they quote-unquote detonate, they actually won't manage to drop their payload, and so you can actually shoot them out of the sky without damaging your own troops. Makes Antir have some sort of counterplay against them, which is obviously necessary. It was a pretty weird interaction. There you go, you can see just how deadly they are. Connecting with all of the different forces over here. Spying the T2 constructor, that was definitely a prime target. You'll see me selecting a bunch of these over here in just a second and moving them back over towards the blue side, trying to shut down this T2 constructor so that the T2 economy doesn't come back up and online. We have the lab already resurrected over here. My goodness, those resbots putting in some good work and some spectators drawing here. Apparently, some spectators are being rather naughty in the chat, so we'll be monitoring that as we move forward here. Nice little T2 transition on the southern side of the Antarctic. What I want to know, though, is what you think about this map. What changes would you propose in order to make this map fa fair and balanced? As far as the games that we played, it seemed like the European side, specifically the, well, the Eastern side in general, had a tremendous advantage in a lot of the, uh, a lot of the games that we played. I'm curious, though, if that was just the alignment of teams and whatnot. Not entirely sure. There you go. You can see me taking down the T2 Constructor right there, forcing out another T2 Constructor. I was pretty happy with that. Considering each and every one of these only costs 65 metal and 2,000 energy, they're actually relatively cheap for the amount of value that you can get out of them. The trade-off, of course, being they have to be very carefully micro, because if not, you actually end up doing a whole lot more damage, uh, either to yourself or to nothing. Go ahead and continue clearing this as the spectators are getting noisy. There we go. Big old barrage. Connects with a bunch of the metal extractors back here. Forcing sniffs a little bit further off the front lines here. Also providing momentary vision for those rocket hovercraft to continue firing away. Yeah, lovely, lovely stuff. The Southern Navy is looking menacing as well. We do have a bunch of Paladins out here. Paladins, not the namestay of keeping a T2 Navy afloat, though. My goodness, we are going for metal storages. Uh, Stasu may be unaware of the fact that metal storages don't actually contribute anything but a slightly larger number to the, yeah, the little, uh, the little bar up on the top side. Those metal storage is not going to serve well. More likely than not, this was a miscue. More likely than not, we uh, meant to queue up maybe a bunch more title generators or some such and accidentally queued up a whole bunch more uh, metal storage here. But rolling in the deep with about 33,000 metal storage, certainly not going to be the end of the world. Here's some more of those martyrs coming across the map here. And you can see they don't do a tremendous amount of damage on their own, but because you can build so many of them, my goodness, they can really start to hurt. One of the things that I like reviewing about these games, or that I like about reviewing these games, specifically games that I've played in, is it gives me an opportunity to see where I was inefficient with my unit usage. And certainly in one case here, you can see that my lack of scouting has left me to take inefficient targets right now. So you can see I'm going to try blasting down anti-air defenses that are too strong for my units, right? That's a fair pop-up turret, and those are extremely, well, resistant. <laughs> that being said, I guess they're only resistant when they're closed up right there. That one, not being closed up. Yeah, definitely meant that it uh, actually ended up going down pretty quickly. But you can see there are obvious targets that would make a whole lot more sense. There's these southern navies over here that are a little bit too grouped up right here, for instance. Sib's navy right here. That would be an excellent target. The uh, LLTs over here were dissuasive, but really they shouldn't have been. These metal extractors should have been blasted down. The LLTs even could have fallen over here. Taking out the uh, advanced geothermal over here could have been a prime target. 
come some more of these bad boys. Oh, failing to hit that jammer over there. Coming in from a bit of a strange angle, so unable to actually do anything about it. We've got a big naval battle just moments away from engaging over on this top side. Loads and loads of frigates and a couple of destroyers too, but also a whole bunch of platypus getting ready here from Kaiser, the purple commander, getting ready to send those across the map. They're going to be marching out of Russia, down towards the coast, towards the UK, and I imagine probably towards the, uh, yeah, the shoreline line of the US. Who would have thought amphibious bots would be the end of the, uh, the New York shoreline. <laughs> Now here we go. Nice little uh, navy continuing to be built up with some of these missile ships on the southern side. A little bit less aggression than I think I'd like to see here though. Really what you want to be looking for right now are these dreadnoughts. Once you build enough of these dreadnoughts, it can be really difficult to shut down a navy without essentially torpedo bombers. Basically the only thing I can think of that can really efficiently take those down. And Aphis is already building on the southern side here as well as an advanced geo. Another, another potential case where a little bit better scouting, and maybe I would have had a slightly easier time targeting that. You can see with no vision of what exactly is going on over here, scouting that with a single plane wouldn't have been a bad idea. You can see I'm sending a couple of fighters across. The T1 Legion fighters are also scout planes, which is a bit strange. It's good to be aware of them, though. But certainly you can see, myself well included, it is very easy to become hyper-focused on a single opponent and try to take them out. And then suddenly you actually end up in a spot where you're neglecting extremely efficient trades. There you go. You can see I've sent this massive queue of bombers across trying to take out the Amexes. And there we go. Down to go a bunch of the LLTs. Was it very efficient? Not particularly. Because wasting all those on LLTs, I think it only takes one or two per LLT right there. Not necessarily the best way of doing that. It is prompting tons and tons of static defense right here out of the blue commander, though. Certainly draining a whole lot of the metal out of the economy, where otherwise it might have been spent on units or other uh, forces that would have contributed much more significantly with the uh, with the frontliners of my team. First destroyer almost out of the lab right here. We are building up quite a force right now. The blue team, yeah, we are up to T2, I was going to say. We're, we're at the very least getting ready for T2, but it looks like we're in full swing. We've got a couple of those lightning boats out now. We've also got some buccaneers coming out right now from uh, Oslex, the Seafoam Green Commander. Oh, we've even got a rattlesnake up on the high ground here, firing away at this T1 Navy. More than happy to just stand there and take the, take the heat. Not recommended. Those rattlesnakes definitely hurt, and especially in the high arcing mode. You absolutely do not want to sit there and take that firepower. Destroyers up front are going to get melted away. Oh, no. This is not the engagement the purple players should be looking for. Now, luckily, the pink commander can't keep these units stationary for all too long. If he does, the rattlesnake is going to do tremendous damage. But those destroyers going down right off the bat definitely hurts. That being said, the frigates march forward. And you know what? The frigates are all about close-range firepower. They've jumped on top of the destroyers. They have enough range. They have the firepower. And I think the destroyers are going to be beat. Yeah, Destroyer's beaten back right now by just a superior number of frigates, and my goodness, the battlefield is a bloody one at that. Metal sinking to the bottom of the ocean floor right there, slowly but surely. Just like that, sending the forces forward, collapsing on top of this entire navy. The entire pink navy has collapsed. Suddenly more and more forces coming out for the purple commander, continuing to build a sizable economy on the northern side. Similar collapse on the southern side here as well as the Paladin showcase exactly why you're not supposed to build them in mass. You need them, but you don't need them in mass, especially not as a uh, single spammable unit. They do a decent amount of damage, but certainly not enough to stand up against T1 spam. You need the Dreadnoughts for that. Just like that, a huge amount of metal goes to waste out in the oceans. Whoever manages to reclaim those is going to be on top. And right now that advantage is going strictly to the favor of the blue team. You can see those green res subs, well, not resurrecting, but I honestly would just prefer to see it reclaimed just so we can get that all turned into more efficient T2. Kamikaze drones coming over here, but these units are too close. The friendly fire would be massive, so they can't actually do anything. That's at least what I remember thinking in my head as I was looking at that. Aggression forming on the southern side. A single belcher to blast down some of the static defense. Bit of a bit of a strange siege unit because it fires well, fire <laughs> fires a big glob of plasma, uh, plasma napalm, I guess you could call it. Good for blasting away those static defense, but definitely uh, doesn't do the damage as upfront as, for instance, plasma weaponry does. Shotgunners up here, going to be quite good for dealing with any tankier units that do show up. 
They essentially have the cannon that is mounted on a juggernaut, the, the arm cannon of a juggernaut. However, it's uh, obviously just one arm cannon per, per unit right there. Big fighter wave sent across right here. Trying to get a scout of what's going on. We check the vision radius here. You can see these planes have a tremendous line of sight range. Very, 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 very good for getting a view of what exactly is going on around the map. Just pretty poor as far as actual fighters go. Yeah. <laughs> they, uh, they don't have nearly the heat-seeking capabilities that most other T1 fighters have. And so the problem you run into with that is that uh, most of the time they'll be out microed or out, out dog fought, as, uh, as I guess the, the airman's term would go. Capital ship is out here. And this capital ship has to stay alive. A call goes out to defend the flagship, and I think that's absolutely correct. If this capital ship continues to press forward and continues to apply pressure and continues to melt away a bunch of these top-level subs here, sorry, top-level ships, then I think the capital ship will be well worth its value. Capital ships have been adjusted, so too does my have to uh, understanding of how efficient they can be have to change. The uh, capital ship used to be a little bit of a waste of metal. There was, a, there was hardly any map where you could get really enough value to justify it. Nowadays, the capital ship fires a much meatier round, especially the Black Hydra, but also the Epoch. It means that the capital ships actually fit quite a bit nicer into the naval field. They, they feel much more like a T3 unit at the very least. So now that we see res, uh, or sorry, not res subs, we see uh, serpents, the assault submarines, or the, the long-range battle submarines. Uh, now would be an excellent time to start going into the mass paladin, certainly. Fortunately, though, all that wreck has already gone back to the blue team, meaning that their navy is looking absolutely stellar. Epoch still firing away over here, though. That's actually great. We actually have an incinerator here as well, the uh, heat ray gun, massive heat ray cannon. Perfect for blasting away anything and everything. Mass incinerator, actually quite capable as far as destroying T3 goes as well. In case you're looking for a Legion T2 solution to T3, the incinerator works pretty good. You can see Barnek Barzi cries out, what on earth was that? Here come those kamikaze drums. You can see, performing quite a bit less well against the T2. A couple of direct hits against this Buccaneer and only lost about 33% or so. The incinerator though is so cool. I believe it leaves a little napalm on the floor where it cuts to. I'm not entirely sure about that. Yeah, it looks like it does. It leaves a little napalm on the floor wherever it shoots at. Uh, but this is the big problem with the incinerator is it's extremely prone to friendly fire. Oh no, you can see it cutting through its friendly units. Yikes. Yeah, you have to put those things right up on the front line and you have to make sure they stay on the front line because otherwise they are prone to turning their cannons directly around and facing them into the face of friendly units. I've been told it's a bit of an engine bug. It's not intended behavior, but uh, knowing how your unit works regardless is important. Long range torpedo launcher firing away at some of these uh, battle subs, which is important. Gonna be great for static defense, so those battle subs quite expensive. 1800 metal apiece, my goodness, yeah, those subs are very, very pricey. Losing them to static defense, obviously not ideal. The railgun trucks going up against T2 and not finding very much success, no. Incinerator here, quite good. I wonder if you could make a command where you just, you, you end up right-clicking across just to make it manually fire across an area, just to sweep it back and forth, just to keep an area completely coated in napalm. Yeah, these engineers that are reclaiming everything, though, doing so much work. Yeah, suddenly the blue team has turned this entire battle around. You can see the blue navy has grown exponentially. Torpedo bombers up in the air. Gonna be trying to blow apart a whole bunch of these frigates that were pulled forward here, but this is just good old-fashioned T1. Now we're ready for a T2 transition, though. All the red subs that the purple player has had that have been eating up this metal have eventually turned all of it into a juicy T2 transition. Now paladins are gonna be running forward. Similarly, though, I'd like to see a couple of destroyers mixed in here. Uh, battleships, pardon me. Battleships mixed in in order to dish out some serious damage. Will it matter, though? The pink player just can't keep up with the same production. We have a T2 lab here. The T2 lab, not gonna help you all too much. Unless you go for the forbidden strategy of tumbleweeds. There we go, incinerator blasting away some of these railgun trucks. Hilariously efficient unit when it's used in the right spot at the right time. The uh, incinerator. 2,300 metal, though, certainly costly to front. Uh, especially for your first T2 unit. 
very, very expensive. <laughs> the friendly fire, man. The friendly fire is brutal. There it goes, melting away a commander. Beautiful. Should be getting quite a lot of experience from this, I imagine. Well, I guess not. For some reason or another, not getting much experience from that uh, Legion commander. Almost feels like a bug. Virtually everything gains a tremendous amount of experience from commanders. We're going into assault submarines here in this battle underneath Africa, I guess. The, the southern crown of Africa, or the southern heel of Africa. We've, uh, we've got a lot of Predator subs going up against the the uh, Serpents, the long-range battle subs. Can't help but feel like this is a little bit of a mismatch lineup here. Yeah, we're going for more and more battleships, but I'm just not sure if that's what you need. Yeah, with so many of these submarines blasting away completely efficiently. Definitely not ideal scenario right there. Let's see the economy. Started up here. We've got the APHAs up and running. Right now we're building a whole bunch of constructor planes. Also building a second T2 lab to start mass fabrication. Trying to build a big fighter screen. I uh, felt like playing some Legionnaire, but Legionnaire is always a little tricky. Certainly those martyrs fall off after a little while. That being said, though, there still feels like there's a couple opportunities where you might be able to sneak them through. For instance, I spy a path right through here, where I imagine some damage could be done. Little things like that, extremely difficult to notice in-game, and I'm sure if you played a game of Beyond All Reason, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Things that you can go back and look at in a replay, and it makes extreme perfect sense. I mean, it's, it's crystal clear. But, uh, yeah, when you're actually playing the game, it's very difficult. You can see I call out building up torpos. The idea being to build up a bunch of torpedo planes and then eventually unleash them on all these submarines over here. Hopefully be able to do enough damage. An epoch of the blue team's own, though. Funded by the corpses of the enemy. Gonna start making its way towards the front line, and I just don't know if this epoch has gotten its value out. 33 kills, but 17,000 metal. One of the things that was pointed out to me in another video, a previous video, is the one with Full Metal Plate. It was a water version of Full Metal Plate. Someone pointed out that the inclusion of the anti-nuke boat was actually for its line of sight and radar range, which is tremendously large as opposed to the capital ship, which is relatively small in comparison anyways. Good to know because it's something that I had never considered personally. Here come the torpedo bombers. Set out a fight command to try and blow up whatever they could. Most of them missing their bombs, though. <laughs> and my goodness, the anti-air is thick here, too. Torpedo bombers having essentially no effect in this four versus two fight right here. Torpedo bombers, extremely difficult. Difficult, the word I choose to use for them. Capital ship has been pulled back over here. I don't believe there's a radar jammer here either. Yeah, I don't see any radar jammer ships. It's just, uh, just a lowly T1 composition. You can tell definitely more experience on the water right here for the blue team. We have the radar jammer ship, we have the capital ship, we have the anti-nuke boat. We have tons and tons of anti-air as well. Things looking quite a bit more complex and quite a bit more, well, effective, to put it bluntly, for the green players, the green and blues out on the high seas over here. The blue team is looking relatively rock solid. No gaps in the armor as far as I can tell right now. Potential gap in the armor, though, could be this shoreline right here. You can imagine some amphibious units sneaking up this shoreline and doing a bunch of damage to the blue commander. It could certainly hurt. Salamanders, for instance, one option when you're thinking of units to go for. Armada commanders forced to use turtles, which are uh, quite a bit less impressive. I suppose that's fair, though. Cortex commanders paying a premium for just about every unit that they use. It's fair that some of the Armada ones would be a little worse. Kadia stands, building a nice little defensive line over here. We have sharpshooters holding the lines. We also have a bunch of missile boats firing up onto the shoreline over here. A little bit of overkill on both fronts right there, but I'd say it's probably fine. Going for some static defense at home, while also getting a nice proper economy set up. We've got the advanced geo as well as a fusion reactor. We're going to go for a second fusion reactor. Wouldn't mind even seeing this uh, T2 lab eaten up right here to just extra greed for the units right there. Yeah, we definitely need some sonar. Sonar or some advanced radar. Anything to keep these ships firing away at each other. You can see this boat firing at essentially its max distance. Doesn't exactly know where it's firing at, though. Just kind of firing off out into the distance. Not ideal, but it's better than nothing. But here comes the beast. Built up in the back line. Spammed over many minutes. A final goal has been reached. 
a depressing end to an extremely difficult battle. <laughs> How many dragons do we have in total here? 13 dragons head towards the main facilities, the mainland North America. The dragons are going to make landfall here, bringing down commanders, aphises, fusions, flak turrets. It doesn't matter. Nothing will survive the perishing might of the flames of the dragon. As it burns across Canada, North America, all goes down in the blast, the blink blur blast of flame that comes out of the forward facing snozzles of those flying demons. Fusion gets toggled down right there in a beautiful airplay, results in a total collapse of the economy on the northern side. Despite the fighters' best efforts here, despite the, uh, despite the T2 fighters, there's just nothing you can do against 20, 20 flying dragons. They're just too powerful. Too powerful to be kept alive. Yeah, you can see them shooting them down now. Legion T2 Air has been upgraded, so it is actually up to date with most, most air mods and whatnot, so... The fighters actually do keep up with basically everything, as far as I'm aware. There's, uh, there, there used to be some weird hiccups where air reworks and interactions and that sort of thing would cause some weird issues. But as far as I'm aware now, the fighters are basically in the same spot as a lot of the other T2 fighters. The caveat to that being that uh, Legion actually has two different classes of T2 fighter. You have the Interceptor, which is the, or sorry, the Legion Air, which is the de defensive fighter. Uh, and then you also have this bad boy, which I believe is called, oh, well, got obliterated. Is there another one over here? There's not another one over here. I believe it's called an interse Interceptor. It's extremely quick and it fires essentially a shotgun blast forward, which is uh, pretty interesting as far as, you know, airplanes go, but uh, very effective and especially effective against big single targets like, for instance, the Dragon. The Navy is pushing forward right here. Mass Despot accompanied by Buccaneer. This is exactly the composition that you're looking for as a uh, Cortex Commander. Covers your underwater as well as your above water bases. And just like that, Stacey is overwhelmed by the dragons coming up and over the seas, as well as the boats floating on across them. A couple of marauders were produced right here. That's an excellent idea to go for those marauders and try and send them up the shoreline. But unfortunately, too much damage has been taken. And we are already looking quite in the red. I'm going to go ahead and speed up this replay because it should be to nobody's surprise as we watch these units sweep across the southern side of the world, dipping down below the horn here of South America, squeezing through the pass, and eventually into the bases on the back lines. Marauder run by on the northern side, gonna find, well, they do find the commander, but they choose to ignore it here as they move towards North America once more, ready to put the herd on. Demons coming in to shut down that uh, Aphis one more time, despite trying to rebuild. They weren't having any of it, and indeed, the uh, Eurasian continents, as well as Africa, and Australia, all that good stuff. Everybody included over on the Eastern Hemisphere, aka the blue team, managed to take this game of Beyond All Reason. Boy, what a fun one, and I am tired. I think I'm going to go lay down and have a nice long nap after casting all these uh, games, as well as hosting one of these live streams. Certainly leaves me tuckered out, but I sure hope you have a great rest of your evening, and I will see you in the very next game of Beyond All Reason. Don't forget to like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And most importantly, let me know what you think about this map down below. I could easily see it becoming one of my favorites of all time.